You'll know why in about 45 minutes. Oh, Solomon. We're back to Solomon again. What a great weekend we had last weekend with missions on Sunday with uh, Aaron Shear here and his uh, trusty companion, Dan. And had a great weekend and all those areas of just mission and missions to uh, go to people's lives. It doesn't matter if someone is on your property or right in your neighborhood and lives 10 feet away from you, if you do not go to them, then uh, they will not hear. As the scriptures say, how will they hear unless they have a preacher? So we're going to preach the Word of God from Ecclesiastes. He entitles himself the preacher, and we're going to go back in there. We again had um, a wonderful time in reaching out to other people and really being refreshed on Sunday after that family field day. And that's uh, one of the, the things that a shepherd would love to see accomplished on a Sunday is that God's people are refreshed, renewed, that you get into the Word of God, you learn something from God, you hear from God, that the Spirit of God does the teaching. And though I am the vessel that is here standing before you by God's anointing and, and by His grace, uh, and I know it is by His grace that we learn from God and we walk away going, wow, I'm refreshed, I'm renewed, I'm challenged, and God has spoken to me. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. Again, we're going back to our study in Ecclesiastes, search for purpose in everything. And, and again, we'll be in chapter number two here in a moment. Uh, as part of a little bit of an introduction and a reminder, he speaks of Solomon and uh, getting us to a place where we know there's purpose in just this book being in his Bible. He's got 12 chapters of speaking, and he finally gets to the conclusion, and you finally get some things at the end of, hey, fear God and keep his commandments. That's it, Solomon, yeah, but it took a while to get there, and that's what this study is really about is here's a Solomon, a man that is close to God for a long period of time. He's the son of King David. He is passed on to, by David, great words of challenge and to be as he was and to be a man of worship, to be a man with wisdom. And, of course, the wealth that was bestowed upon him was God's wealth in him. And God told him through David in just his challenge before he left the earth and his deathbed time to just stay close to him. He ended up building the temple the place in which God would commune with his people. And, of course, Solomon uh, makes a prayer and a benediction. He does incredible things there with his preaching message at the temple dedication. There's so many good things found in 1 Kings until you get to around chapter number 11 and you realize that his heart was turned from God because of all of the wives that had their hearts against God and idolatry and there's Solomon. Solomon, again, writing the book of Proverbs, some of the best stuff. Most of the Proverbs are written by him, and you see the incredible wealth of wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Um, you see in the Song of Solomon his understanding of relationship in the Lord, and you're thinking, wow, how could this man get to this place in his life? How could any of us get to that place in our lives? We can if it could happen to Solomon, God's anointed king, could it not happen to us? And of course, we are God's royalty. We are the royal priesthood. We are God's and belong to him in Christ. And we think, okay, yeah, we have that type of heirship with Jesus Christ. By grace, we are saved through faith. And so, yes, we have this incredible relationship with God, incredible relationship, sanctification, if we would allow God to do it, continues in our lives. And we say, okay, why in the world would God put an accounting of a man like this in the Bible? Why didn't he just leave this out and just leave Proverbs and Song of Solomon in there and then have that little snippet in Kings? And then we go, okay, Solomon did pretty good and but we, boy, we get a real peek into this man's life, his heart, and where he is at. He mentions vanity so many times. We know that 
the word vanity, the term vanity, comes up a great deal in this study. We're reminded that he talked of how it's uh, really just a life that filled with futility and emptiness and purposelessness, vexation of spirit. I'm going after this incredible longing for purpose in life, but he sees this longing for life as being an empty one. He has the want of substance to satisfy some kind of desire, and you see it throughout Ecclesiastes, and so thus we're led to this study chapter by chapter each week, wondering what would God have for us to learn. We want God to teach us again in the study today, and I'm going to do this for the next few chapters and see how God would have us, and, and looking at, sometimes I put an outline together, or sometimes I'll just outline it in groups of verses, but we're going to, we're going to walk through it as if this was your Sunday morning devotion time. We're going to cover all the verses, we're going to stop, we're going to put a highlight, a point to it, maybe, I don't know if you in your devotion time, I like to grab a little notebook and write things down as God is showing me things in the Word of God. I'm not saying, well, what do I think of that? I say, God, what are you saying on the Scripture? Holy Spirit, what are you teaching me on the Scripture, in the Scripture? And that's what we're going to do today. Thus, we got to this place where we had a theme verse, and the theme verse has come out of chapter number one. And I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom. So we're going to seek and search out every week in the Word of God, like we always do in the study on Ecclesiastes. We're going to do it by wisdom. Now, the idea that heart is mentioned around 30-ish times in this study, vanity is mentioned 40-ish times, wisdom is mentioned over 20 times, we see that all those pieces come into play here, and we want to say, okay, I'm going to go on a personal seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. And the second half of the verse says what? This sword travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised within because Solomon used this phrase under the sun, under heaven. He kept the one above the sun out of his study. He studied the things of this earth and the things of this life and he kept God out. We're not keeping God out. But we're going to learn what it happens when we do leave God out. And Solomon is our test case. Solomon is, again, a wise man in his kingship and a place of life. And we realize, as we did a couple of weeks ago when we kicked this off, that we need to have a proper exercise in going after the Word of God. We need to properly exercise the Scriptures, study, to show ourselves approved unto God. Work through these. Look at these. Look. Just, just, just. Just consider this, at 9 o'clock and 10.30 every Sunday, there is teaching going on in the cafe. For the youth, for the old timers, there's something going on in the Sunday groups, there's discipleship hour, there's something going on. On Wednesday nights, there's a Bible study. On Monday nights, the women get to, excuse me, on Thursday nights, the women are getting together for a study. Currently, right now, they do two or three of them a year. On Monday nights, they have some prayer time, or they'll do it on Monday or Thursday, so there's prayer time there. There's also a men's study going on currently, and it's on Mondays. There's Bible Institute. Sunday, Monday, we usually have a course on Tuesday. Not many people signed up for that one, so we got two courses going on. And one of them, Pastor Bobby has over 20 people in them. In, the, in that, I think you'd like 20 something people in that. And there's also some people studying the Bible on Monday nights. In Genesis, we've got nearly 15 people there. There's opportunities to study the Word of God. Pastor Brian has got something going with discipleship, partnering with Mike Sidebottom, and over the years we've had some form of way of you learning the Bible, searching out things, with someone teaching you everywhere, any place, anyhow, at any time. You have to be willing to do so. Solomon stopped being willing. And we're reminded in chapter number two how he saw everything that was of God and meant for God to be good turned out to be vanity. It was useless. It was pointless. Do you know that any of those studies, when you do not partake in them or you look at them as being useless or pointless or futile for you, you're just like Solomon. And I'm just like Solomon. Why do you bother? Why do you, why bother? I'm going to end up dying anyway. What means do I have to gain if I just learn more Bible? I just get smarter. If that's your approach, you're going to be just like Solomon. And you'll see that that greater wisdom 
is vanity from that side, keeping out Jesus, keeping out the living word of God, keeping out God Almighty as the one that you give glory to. See, there's, there's our thinking process here. We can get there. I don't want you to get there. Call time out. Stop. Go to God in your morning. Wake up early. Say, God, I need to make some things right with you. I've taken too much time on my own. I've seen life as being vain. It's almost like it's monotonous. Life in you, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I know that he holds the future in his hand. I don't think it. I don't wonder it. I don't believe it. I don't think it. I know. That's a preview that's coming up here in a moment. You'll know I've been preparing this message for two weeks because I've been saying this for a while. It just strikes me how much we think. I think I might think, or I might feel that I might feel. How about the fact that in Jesus Christ you know? Oh, Pastor Aaron put a verse up there last week. It's still, for I know of a surety. You can know. No. No. You see, poor Solomon, all he knew was things under heaven, things under the sun. He had forgotten the one who was above all of that. People get into struggles and difficulties. He got into one. And another, and another, and another, and another. And you and I, we get into those. So what happens? What do you chase after when struggles hit? After they hit or when they hit, meant to put or, after or when struggles hit, and hopelessness grabs hold of your life, what do you chase? What do you go after? What did Solomon go after? We're going to find out today. What, What is it that we are drawn to or chase after should there be a difference between the lost and the believers when confronted with seemingly hopeless scenarios? There sure should be. I've got to chase after God. I've got to chase after scriptures. Look, you may not want to hear anything from me, and that's fine. Praise the Lord, that's okay. That's why I hired like 200 other pastors, okay? They're here. They're available for you. Not to mention the deacons, the ministry leaders, the husbands and wives that are mature in the Lord, the people that are around here saying, hey, you know what happens when I get to a place where it seems like there's a hopeless scenario? I'm torn between chasing after the stuff, more work, more play, more pleasure, more family time, more relationships, and you list them all and they sound good, but seemingly we're stuck in a place where we're chasing after the things that Solomon chased after. They can get us in trouble. There's a few Proverbs that come up. I like to use Proverbs for teaching. And since Solomon wrote them, here we go. It says in Proverbs 10, 2, treasures of wickedness, they profit nothing. He talks about profit a lot in his Ecclesiastes study. But it says there, but righteousness delivereth from death. Ah, the righteousness you have by grace through faith, your salvation, you have been made righteous by Jesus Christ. You are not righteous because of anything you've done. Remember what Jesus said to those Pharisees in our study in the Sermon on the Mount? Except your righteousness exceed the Pharisees and the scribes, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. You, you don't even understand that a clue as to your own righteousness is getting you nowhere, and yet... You think your own righteousness? No, the righteousness from God is what delivers you from death. The treasures of wickedness profit nothing. It also says in Proverbs chapter number 12, excuse me, 11, riches profit not in the day of wrath. You think when you go to heaven, all your riches are going to get you somewhere in the day of wrath, lost person? (laughs) Can't buy your way into heaven. But righteousness delivereth from death. Again, you go back to what is this about what Solomon is saying? Solomon is saying in this chapter number two, eh, it's a waste of time to live. I'm just going to get all the stuff. I'm going to live and I'm going to die. Wait a minute here. That's not the life in Jesus Christ that I know. It says in Proverbs chapter number 14, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It also says in Proverbs 16 the exact same thing. I wonder if God repeats something that is pretty important. We do know that. 
You see, we chase things. Sometimes we just chase parked cars and we catch them and we think, I'm just like a dog. I just keep on chasing things. Sometimes I just keep on chasing my tail and chasing my tail and chasing my tail. Well, what does your chase look like today? What does it look like? Do you search for purpose within yourself? Or do you search for purpose in the Lord and holy God? Do you look and say, wait a minute, I need to chase after the things of God. I need to find out what his purpose is. I need to find out what he wants me to do. And even though I don't find it out, I've got to search because along the way of my search and my chase, I'm going to get closer to him. And that's going to be the byproduct, to be more like Jesus Christ. Well, then what will your chase look like tomorrow? After time in the word of God this morning. See, we're in the word of God this morning. You say we do that all the time. Well, this is a little bit of a devotion study this morning. And we're going to do it that way to cover all of these verses. I'm going to read a few verses, take a pause, read a few verses, and figure out why Solomon was chasing his own tail. Chasing one's tail. I thought it was funny, too. I looked it up. I went, that's exactly the title. I had like 10 titles. And I went, oh, my gosh, that's it. Because when you look it up, you say, where did they come up with this phrase? To be taking action that is ineffectual and does not lead to progress. Refers to how a dog can exhaust itself by chasing its own tail. You ever seen a dog do it? (laughs) Have you ever seen a dog catch their own tail? What would they do if they did? It's the same thing for us. Chasing one's tail, physically, spiritually, it gets to a point where, again, as that expression comes from, to chase one's tail is derived from the action of a dog. It's a pointless exercise that ends in no conclusion or (laughs) the conclusion of a dog finally getting his own tail. Who in the world wants to eat a tail? This morning, again, as we walk through these 26 verses, just follow along with me. Just going to follow along with you. Follow along with me. Follow the Word of God. Watch this. This is going to be a Sunday morning devotion time. Now, some of you have your devotion all set up for this afternoon, this evening, or this morning. You're already at time with God. If you haven't, this does not take the place of it. This is our collective corporate one together. And we're going to do this to see what God has for us. Read the scripture, see what God says. Read the scripture, see what God says. Because when it really comes down to it, that's what we're supposed to do when we preach and teach the word of God. And that's when we spend time in the word. What do you say, God? Not my opinion. Verse number one, chapter number two. Follow along. I said in mine heart, there's that phrase, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this is also vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom. That's a weird combination. I'm going to give myself to wine, but then I want to acquaint myself with wisdom. What kind of wisdom is he going to get? It's not going to be God's wisdom. And to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, in which they should do under the heaven all the days of their lives. I see the first one here. Of course, this is another setup of all of us getting, we're we're trying to set this all up for the deeper things by seeing this vanity message. The first thing in the first three verses is there's vanity and worldliness. Here's your first thing. That's what he's saying. There's vanity, vanity, vexation of spirit in living off of the pleasures of this world. Laughter. We know what it is. Ha, 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 ha. Everybody loves a good laugh, don't you? Don't you? You don't like laughing, do you? What's the matter with you people? Mirth. Simple word means to have joy or be in a place of gladness and joy. Unto wine, the implication here clearly is some type of intoxication. 
strong drink to get him to, he sees, okay, I'll look at wisdom and folly, I'll put the two together. That's a worldly way of going about things. See, pleasure, enjoyment, and worldliness, we've gotten crazy over that. We're nuts. We've been like a dog. Oh, oh, give me something more, give me something more. What was that old thing, kibble and bits? How old am I? I just thought that. Father, could you stop me in the name of God? I gotta have something else. I gotta have something else. I mean, we have this little. Do- oh, dear Jesus. I'm not even bringing it up. Thank you, God, for stopping me. We have a little dog at the house. I'll just say that. She's never satisfied. She doesn't chase her tail. She's just a pain. But she's my wife's dog. She's not in here right now, so hopefully she won't listen to the second one. We live in a pleasure mad society and world. We live in a place where I need to have more, I need to have more, I need to have more. Proverbs 14, 13 says, even in laughter the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. It says in verse number 14, the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Proverbs 14, 13 and 14. Here we are with this guy Solomon, and here we find vanity in this worldliness of pleasures, worldliness of of all this mirth and laughter, he's trying to find some type of purpose under the sun, absent of God. Secondly, let's continue. Verse number four. I made my great works. I builded my, me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me sir. Hang on a minute, this happened to me. When you're, I read this like five, ten times. I'm thinking, this was the wisest man on the face of the earth. How did he speak like this? How did he get away with it? I don't feel bad now. When I speak brownie talk, that's like, I'm, hey, I'm talking like Solomon. I mean, I feel pretty good right now. I'm doing pretty good. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. God wants it to be spoken this way. Also, I had great possessions. Of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem. Think about this man. Think about this man. I made me great works. I made me gardens and orchards. I made me pools of water. He says up there in verse number four through six, go back one, vanity in works. Vanity in works. What kinds of great works is he speaking of? I did these great things. I've got a project. I got another project. I got another project. Now, I'm not picking on you. Projects are awesome. They're great. Just because I don't do any projects doesn't mean that they're bad. But projects are good if they're profitable to the advancement of God's ministry, God's kingdom, God's gospel work. I'm making my home to be a little bit better so that I can invite people over to have a Bible study or a small group. I'm making my house better as a better steward because my children, they just, they just, they just ruin everything. So I have to make it better. Those are good purposes. But to find a project after to find a project after to find a project, Solomon's finding all kinds of projects. Don't forget that he built so much stuff. And I mentioned earlier, he built the temple. That's good stuff. He planted vineyards. He made gardens and orchards. He planted trees. He, did, he made pools of water to do irrigation. He was advanced in the way that he did things, and he was led by God to do so. The water that would water the wood that bringeth forth the trees. You see, this man had a great, simple approach here to doing things, but he lost the why he was doing it. I need to build houses. I need to build cities. I need to take care of things. I need to build this beautiful temple for God. Solomon, he was over all of this stuff. He did supervise the building of the temple we know in 1 Kings. We know this. You know what? He got to a place, though, that it was vanity in his estimation. Why? Because he lost the overriding purpose to give glory to God. If you're doing something, anything, And it's for God. The project's for God. It is not vanity. But if it is not for him, you'll get to the end of it and go, that stunk, 
That didn't look good. Let's do it again. Let me get another project. Let me get another project. I'm going to get satisfied one of these days with the things that I'm doing, and I'm going to be pleased with them, and then I'll be happy. You'll be just like Solomon. You'll keep on building things. We continue in verse number 7. I got ahead of myself. Let me read verses number 7, 8, and 9. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before. Remember, he had so much that was given to him by God. And he had his own servants, but he also went and he purchased servants from other people's. He says in verse number 8, I gathered me also silver and gold, the peculiar treasure of kings and the provinces. God had given him all that he needed, but he kept on going after more and more and more. He says, I gave me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments that all of all sorts. In verse number 9, so I was great. It's not necessarily that he's putting his chest out that I'm great, but he's saying I am great in what I own. All the things that he has, he went after them. I was great and increased with more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. But herein lies the vanity. There's vanity and wealth for Solomon. There's vanity and wealth for every single one of us. You work, 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 work. Projects, 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 projects. But they're not for the glory of God. They end up being vanity, empty, purposeless, They show you that there's really no meaning to doing more projects. Sometimes people get caught up in the preparation and the planning. They go out and they buy things. They got to get it all done. I was like, I got to get this. Oh, gosh. You know, you mean people like that? Oh, they're so tied into that stuff. Maybe that's you. Oh, my goodness. I can't wait to do my next project around the house. And it's a good thing until you get to the end of it and go, when's the next project? Because then when we are done with all of that going after the wealth and the works. He, he, by the way, he provided in verse number 7, servants and maidens, he got them some cash. He gave them jobs. He made it possible for everyone. But what good was it? It was vanity and wealth. Verse number 10 and 11. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. He's saying, hey, God gave this all to me. I didn't keep my heart from it. And by the way, you see in 1 Peter, you see in in, in the New Testament as well, God has given things for you to enjoy. But he went over the top. How do I know? I read verse number 11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I labored to do, and he brings his declarative his default unfortunately behold all was vanity vexation of spirit and there's the biggie that adds to those two there was no profit there was no profit under the sun exactly and he'll tell you really why here in a moment that's vanity to me in wickedness why do you say that It's wicked, and it can lean you to wickedness by doing everything for yourself. You can get to a place where you're full of yourself. You can get to a place, we all can, where we go, huh, because this is the deeper issue of Solomon. This really is the deeper issue. It perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates and perpetuates. It gets going. It's not something that happens to you over the first maybe two, three, four, five years of salvation, but you're in Christ and you, okay, let me backpedal a little bit. I gotta do things. I gotta take care of my children. I gotta take care of my family. Five years, 10 years goes by, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years, and you wake up and go, you know, I need to find some pleasure in this life because I'm miserable. I don't want to withhold anything from my heart for any joy. I'm not filled with joy. I'm down in the dumps. I'm depressed. My heart, it rejoice in labor. This was my portion. Some of you are workaholics. Some of us have a propensity to work, but we have to know why we're working, what we're doing it for. Because vanity comes in the wickedness when you see, and he says in verse number 11, I looked at everything that I had labored, all that I had wrought, all that I had done, and it was a waste. Proverbs chapter number 6, I was reading it yesterday. It struck me, verses number 16 through 19. You can look at them later. But it says, these 16s that the Lord hate, you know that's this one, some of you. 
Yea, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth, that's where I was going, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. This is him. He's got wicked imaginations. You can hear it already. You can see it already. Plus, we needed to put wickedness in here somewhere. It's a great W word to point out a man that has fallen away from God. Wickedness almost as palatable and tolerable. Verses number 12 through 17. Here we go. Our devotion continues in the word of God. And I turn myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? If the king, if you think you can come after the king and do more than I have done, are you kidding me? I'm the king. What in the world could a man profit if he didn't do, if he could try and do anything more than what I have done? Hang on, Solomon. And of course, we need to hang on because he continues in this. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. Okay, so wisdom, it excels. That's good. So he's bringing in a good statement here, right? But watch the way it turns. <sighs> the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. Okay, I'm good with that. So he's given some good proverbs here, right? And I myself perceive that all one event happeneth to them all. Yep, okay, so... He's, he's making some good statements here. They're, they're good proverbs. They're true. But this is what happens. Because verse 15, what comes up? His heart. Then said I in my heart, like you and I can do, as it happened to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart that this also is vanity. When you start being told by someone or you tell other people, why don't you just follow your heart? Whoa. Watch it. What is your heart currently filled with? See, that's really important. You can tell Solomon's heart right now is not doing well. He says in verse number 16, For this is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all have forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? As the fool. Whoa, look at the conclusion he's coming to. In his heart he's saying, My life as the wisest man on the face of the earth, it ends just like a fool. True. But the way that he is speaking of this tells you his heart is his heart is far from God. It's so far from God. He said, ah, I could just be a fool and I'd be just as well off as if I had wisdom. Verse number 17, therefore I hated life. Ooh. Now I'm not talking about someone that would want to take their own life. But I'm saying when someone hates their life, and I've heard people say that over the years, they hate their life. They hate all that God has done for them because they hate the life that God's given. I'm talking about believers. I hate my life. How heartbreaking is this? Therefore, I hated my life. This can happen to any of us because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is many vexation of spirit. Here's your vanity of this one. Here's vanity and wisdom, he says. Vanity and wisdom. It's of nothing to have, have, have wisdom. That's what he's saying. I am wise and have wisdom beyond my years, but yet this is just as if I was a fool. Again, let me remind you that God revealed to us in the book of Job the man who was righteous above all. At that time, he eschewed evil. He also showed that he was a sinner. Here we are in Ecclesiastes, the wisest man on the face of the earth. Face of the earth, we find out he's also a fool. And you and I sit around and read the Bible like that one doesn't hit me. Oh, this hits every one of us. You and I distance ourselves away from God. A week, two, three, four, we start seeing. Ah, oh, it's useless and a waste of time for me to spend time in the Word of God. I can't get anything out of it. Why should I bother? I hope there's a good message on Sunday from that brown guy because if he messes up, I won't have anything all week long. 
Shame on us. I wish you'd preach some better messages. Go listen to Bobby, he's much better. You see that I'm just saying that, that's vanity. It's this foolishness. Oh, go listen to Brian, he's better. What, what are we doing? Why don't you go listen to God? Why don't you and I flip this thing that's going on Solomon's way because we go down Solomon's way and go, no more. No more life of vanity. No more wasting time. You and I have very little time. You think you're 15, 20 years old and you got lots of time. Who knows how much time you got? And if it's all under the sun and under heaven, then what purpose is it? Back to where we are in our teaching. Our devotion continues in verse number 18. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the men that should, shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? By the way, it's pretty good. Anybody own a company here? Who are you going to leave it to? I hope it's not a fool. What are they going to do with it? We'll find out from Solomon. He says, yet, there, yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I have shown my, myself wiser to the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair over all the labor which I took under the sun. By the way, he is a crybaby, isn't he? Just like me. And just like you. We like to whine, don't we? We like to cry. And we hope that we have an audience. Well, he's the preacher. He's got a big audience. They must be looking at him like, he used to be the God guy. Verse number 21. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored, therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. Whoa. Here's vanity in wills. You say in your will, in your son? No, no. In wills, like your last will and testament. <laughs> it's a W. I had to fit it in there. But think of it. I use this illustration in first service. I'll, I'll give you just a Reader's Digest version. I speak of my Jewish father-in-law, the Jewish Pharaoh. He turned 81 the other day. Incredibly wise man. He had his own business, transmission business, for 58, 59 years. All he ever wanted to do was leave that business to his son. That's all he ever wanted to do. You know. That's all he ever wanted to do. You know. He wanted to leave it to his son. But he realized after a bunch of years of it being in there that he's going to be like Solomon going, what am I going to do? I'm going to leave it to a fool. I'm going to leave it to someone who's going to destroy it. Well, that's truth that haven't. And the story goes, he sold it to a nephew who was in the transmission business. And now Milton Ryan's transmission service doesn't exist anymore. It took two years, and it was gone. 58 years of being the transmission king in a city a little over a million people. Started the business in 59. All he wanted to do was turn this business over to somebody. You can make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in a good living. You know what a master transmission builder, rebuilder makes? Over 100 grand a year, easy. 10 grand a month. As I told everybody in first service, I'm resigning on Monday and I'm going to go be a transmission guy again. Because <laughs> I'm in it for the money. I couldn't, I wouldn't know where to put anything. You see, it's the vanity and wills that he's saying, who you leave everything to, it doesn't matter because it's of the glory of the Lord. You just better trust and do and be done. You're in glory now and it doesn't matter. We finish this out. Verse number 22 and 23. For what hath man all his labor in a vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? Great question. For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. Maybe this one will hit just about all of you. This is vanity and worry. Some of you, all you do is worry. He's the king of of the nation of Israel, he's got more wives than he knows what to do with. Maybe that's what, no, he's talking about his labor. He's talking about his possessions. He's talking about his money. He's talking about all the people that he's done things for. He's just, oh, I've been the one most wonderful guy in the world. And it's all been vanity and vexation of spirit. He says, vexation of my heart. And he says, when I go to sleep, I can't sleep. Maybe some of you can't sleep. Because all you do is stay awake instead of sleeping. You worry. 
Do you worry? Solomon did. Whew. He thought, there's no personal profit in all that I did. Wah, wah, wah. Pessimistic, glass half full, wasted my time, did all that I did, and no one appreciated me. Well, we see in the scriptures, for all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh no rest in the night. This is also vanity. It's a waste of time to worry. It's vanity and worry. And here's the last piece of our devotion. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink. That he should make his soul enjoy good in his life. This is his conclusion? This also I saw. That it was from the hand of God. Of course, it came from God that I can just eat and drink and just hang out and kill time in life. Verse 25, he says, who can eat or who else can hasten thereunto, hereunto, more than I? Boy, I got everything. <laughs> who can, who's got better food than I do? Maybe at your house this afternoon at the ball game, you got ribs, pulled pork. None of you can't even wait till 3 o'clock, can you? Okay. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Yes, yes, yes. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. That is also vanity and vexation of spirit. This last one here in our devotion is vanity and wantonness. Vanity and wantonness. What does it mean to have a wantonness in your life? As Solomon finishes up this section, this chapter, it's another conclusion from a mixed up, carnal, foolish man who is wanton. He is thinking, I need to have more frolic in my life. I need to just eat and drink and hang out. Wantonness. A sportiveness. A gaiety. It's lasciviousness and lewdness, as it says in Romans 8 and 2 Peter 2. What happened to all the blessings from God that you received, Solomon? Mark Brown, what happened to all that you saw that God did in your life? Why are you whining and crying and thinking at the end of your life it's still all vanity? When you look up on that screen and you see that search for purpose, search for purpose, if it comes up that it's vanity, it's not of God because God has not put anything in your life that is of him that is purpose, that is not purposeful. It's not emptiness, but if it's of the world and if it's of you and of your own thinking and of your own worldly wisdom, then guess what? You're wasting your time. And all of us can go right to the end of our life and say, boy, God, I wasted so much time in my life. We'll suffer loss, suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ, suffer loss. And you think of that and you go, the definition of vanity, emptiness, want of substance to satisfy desire, fruitless desire or endeavors, trifling labor that produces no good, that comes from our Webster's Dictionary. So chasing one's tail say we covered everything. So here you go. I'm going to give you five minutes of telling you and showing you two things that you do not need to do. In light of all of that, here's two simple things. They're very simple, but as sometimes the word of God comes across, the simple things, the gospel sometimes is hard to bow our knees to. Here's your first one up on the screen. Instead of chasing one's tail by being ingrained in our human thoughts, let us be immersed in our holy God's thoughts. Hmm. Okay. Romans 13, real quick. Romans 13. Romans 13, verse number 12 through 14. Some of you men will remember the urgent theme on our men's conference in 2019 that included verse 11, knowing the time, that it's now high time to awake out of sleep. It's urgent. This is our time, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Romans 13, verse 12. It's right up on the screen. The night is far spent, Paul says. The day is at hand. 
Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. This is great advice to every one of us. Solomon knew this and he wrote stuff like this in the book of Proverbs. Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, not in wantonness, not in strife and envying. Verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The word of God has all of your best advice. Not me. I've told you many a times, all I've ever wanted to do to be in the place in the spirit of God is your pastor and shepherd and teacher to just tell you what God says. This is what God says. In Romans 13, hey, the night is far spent. Let us cast off the works of darkness. Let's stop doing things of vanity. Let's get into where we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the flesh will mess with us. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 says something about wisdom. And I, brethren, when I came to you, not excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Look those verses up later on and just sit on those. That'll be a good additional devotion time tonight. And the last thing that God has given us this morning is this, off of our devotion. These are the two things that we want to make sure that we do. Instead, again, of chasing our tail by being ingrained in our human thoughts, let us be engaged in God's thoughts. Be completely immersed in his thoughts. The second one I have for you is this. Instead of chasing one's tail to believe, to think, to feel. Those are all okay. Those are good. All of the world's wisdom. I think I know something. I might know this. I think I know but then you can find out six months later that the, what they put out to you is a complete lie. Has that happened at all recently? I think they're telling the truth. What good is that? Well, I think that I might, and I feel like I should, and I might. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let us simply know things from our God's wisdom. If you have to make a really important decision and it's due in three weeks and you haven't been spending any time with God, you're going to have a tough time making God's decision because you won't know what to do. Why don't you start today getting so much closer to God so when the big decisions come up or the times of hopelessness and seeming like empty scenarios and bad scenarios, you go, I know what God wants me to do. I know what he wants me to do. I know, I know, I know. I know is a good place to live. Now I know, I, I think Cheryl loves me. I kind of feel like she does. I'm hoping, pff, I know my grandson Gabe, he loves me. I know it. This is the way it ought to be. Here's your two verses. You can write them down. I'm going to take you to Romans chapter number one. You can write the 1 Corinthians one down too because it's talking about, again, the wisdom of this world. We need the wisdom of God. Now, you say, well, Romans chapter number one, I know where you're going. Well, this is written as I understand if I read that the introduction or the first few words, Paul's saying, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. He's written to the believers as much as he's written all that are in Rome. This is quite an incredible letter. Don't ever forget this. Not for all the things that you know about, you know, teaching you of God's grace and God's truth and doctrine and all that. He's speaking to everyone. He covers the whole gamut. Jew, 
Gentile, barbarian, lost, saved, believer, not believer. He's got the whole gamut. Well, when he says the saints, that's you and me, believers. And he's saying, hey, saints, let me get you a handle on something. Verse number 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse number 19 says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. He said, that's the course of the lost world in Rome. He's speaking to them and tell them, hey, your conscience has told you that God exists. Okay, I got that. Hey, you still got your conscience when you were born again. You added, you got an ad, and that's the Holy Spirit of God. So the truth of the word of God, the conscience, you're going, God is watching me. I joked with you before. I grew up in a lost home, a religious home, but I was always told, when you leave this house, Mark, you just remember God's watching your every move. And my mother was right. And thank the Lord she got saved before she left this earth. She was teaching me an awareness of God that the scriptures I never saw until after I got saved. It says in verse number 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power in God is so that they were out of excuse. Look around. God's around. God's at work. Verse number 21. By the way, Solomon should have done this. It probably would have helped him a little bit. Of course, he gives credit to God, and he gives God some platitudes, and, and he placates God's existence and everything, but he really just annexes. He pushes away his relationship with God as he's writing Ecclesiastes. And I wonder, believers, saints, as you pay attention to these verses, watch out how you're drawn, how you chase after things, and get your flesh to have way too much pleasure in this world that can mess with us. Verse 21 says, because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Sounds like Solomon. But you're saying Solomon was a wise man, and he was from God, and he was anointed. Do you understand where we could end up as believers in Jesus Christ, and how we could distance ourselves from God, and be in a place where we go, oh, I used to worship God. Verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and two birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Of course, idols, idolatry, making the graven images. Verse 24 and 25. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through his lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. And here it is. Worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed. Who is blessed. Woo. By him, amen. I wonder sometimes how we've just maybe in our carnal thinking put ourselves in the position of where the lost person is thinking this life is vanity. Everything's going to happen for a reason. It's fine. doesn't matter if I have any wisdom from God. I'm going to die just like a fool. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Believer, when you leave this earth, you will not have a second death if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. How do you know? You know. It's by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you have any questions about that, I'll be here at the end of service when everybody's gone, and I'll sit and talk with you if you'd like me to. Believer, guess what? Sometimes we get to a place where we stop the flow of God through our lives, through his word and through his spirit, and we, we wonder why we're at a place where some hopeless, difficult situation scenario comes and we don't know what to do. Before the hopeless scenario comes, how about we do this. It says up there, what will happen when you leave here? You need to push that out, oh boy. Keep on going. There you go. Come on. Where's the question? I don't know. There you go. I pay the guy in second service more money than the person in the first service. From our Bible time this morning, what will you decide to chase this week? Ooh. Human wisdom or God's wisdom? Let's close with a word of prayer. Please bow your heads. Our Father in heaven, this morning we have...
covered a lot of ground on purpose in Jesus' name. This is your word. It is profitable doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I pray in this time of invitation, this time of prayer for the next few minutes, that each person here, by your word, by your spirit, would consider the question, what am I going to chase tomorrow? Because daily, I'm supposed to come to you. I'm to die daily. I'm to praise you and give you thanks daily. I'm to do your will, giving thanks and everything. I pray this morning that your church, your people, would hear from you, and then you would hear from them. In Jesus' name, please stand.